Can gender be shaped by nurture? In 1966, a Canadian baby named Bruce Remo lost his male organ due to a medical accident. Psychologist John Money saw this as a unique experimental opportunity. He believed gender identity is like a blank slate, entirely shaped by upbringing. He urged the Rhymers to raise Bruce as a girl and rename him Brenda. Manny used this case as a model, declaring biological sex irrelevant. Culture and environment are what shape gender. However, the theory's perfection came at the cost of a child's lifelong suffering. Brenda spent her childhood struggling, resisting skirts and tearing dolls. Her behavior was boyish, clearly incompatible with her identity. When 14-year-old Brenda learned the truth, he decided to live as David. However, his distorted childhood left deep, unhealed trauma. At 38, David tragically ended his life in depression. David's tragedy cruelly raises the question, if gender isn't a blank slate, then what are the biological forces that determine who we are? To answer this question, we must go back even further to the master switch hidden deep within ourselves. 200 years ago, human understanding of gender was speculative. Aristotle believed sex was determined by the father's temperature, while 18th century French doctors claimed it could be customized by removing one gland side. Even in post-Enlightenment Europe, people believed a baby's gender depended on the mother's nutrition. These seemingly ridiculous theories were seriously discussed and practiced. True revolutions often arise from unexpected corners. In 1905, scientist Nettie Stevens focused on mealworm cells under the microscope. At 35, she began her doctoral studies, choosing insects over the family path. After countless days and nights of observation, she discovered an unusual pattern. Female beetles have 20 uniform chromosomes, while males have 19 large ones plus a tiny, out-of-place chromosome. She deduced that this tiny chromosome from the father determines the sex. She named the chromosomes that determined fate X and Y. XX for female and XY for male. Unfortunately, in that era, when female scientists faced discrimination, her mentor, Edmund Wilson, published similar results and took the credit. Stephen's name was forgotten for nearly a century. The carrier of gender was identified. Yet how exactly did this pair of chromosomes direct cells to ultimately shape distinct male and female bodies? Between 1947 and 1953, Alfred Yost discovered this logic through operations on rabbit fetuses. He found that female is the default setting in mammalian embryonic development. Only when the Y chromosome signals gonads to become testes, and these secrete male hormones, will the embryo deviate from the default path to become male. Without this, embryos develop into females. What is the gene on the Y chromosome that initiates sex differentiation? This global competition among top laboratories finally found an answer in 1990 when British scientists identified a gene on the Y chromosome called SRY. They injected the SRY gene into a mouse embryo meant to develop as female, XX. This female, with an artificial Y gene signal, developed into a male. The biological pathways of sex seemed clear, but an incident in the arena cracked this boundary. In 1949, Murray Barr assigned his graduate student Ewart Bertram a simple task, compare neurons in tired and normal states. Bertram soon discovered something strange. Female cat neurons had a dark spot near their nuclei's edge, while male cat neurons did not. This discovery was verified in more species. They named this spot sex chromatin, later known as the bar body. People believe sex could be determined under a microscope using just a drop of blood or a strand of hair. This idea soon extended to sport competitions to prevent men from posing as women. The International Olympic Committee introduced gender screening by looking for bar bodies. If present, they were female. If not, they couldn't compete in the women's group. In 1985, Spanish Herdla Maria Patino's cells showed no bar bodies. Although born a girl with normal female traits, she was disqualified 
lost her scholarship, and was abandoned by her boyfriend due to this test. Years later, the truth emerged. She has androgen insensitivity syndrome. Her chromosomes are XY with the SRY gene, but her cells can't receive androgen signals. Thus, her body defaults to developing into female from the embryonic stage. This is the first breach in the gender boundary. The second comes from our brain. In 2015, Professor Duffnid Joel's team analyzed over one, 400 brain scans and discovered that while men and women differ in certain brain regions, very few brains are purely male or female. Most brains contain a mix of male-like, female-like, and shared traits. Professor Joel poetically calls this phenomenon the brain mosaic. These findings offer a deeper explanation for David Reimer's tragedy. His pain stems not only from genetic boundaries, but also from the suppressed, unique brain color. Sex causes tragedies and inconveniences, and X and Y chromosome distinctions don't maximize gene reproduction efficiency. So why dominate nature? The Red Queen hypothesis offers a metaphorical answer. Species must mutate to avoid elimination in the race with viruses and parasites. Asexual reproduction is like a photocopier. Offspring are identical. Once a virus breaks through, the species is doomed. Sexual reproduction reshuffles each generation, creating endless new genetic combinations. Some combinations escape pathogens. Therefore, what we observe is not a flaw in the system, but its essential purpose. This unpredictable diversity is our species' strongest survival barrier. Our gender confusions and struggles may be small echoes of that grand evolutionary dance. Perhaps what we truly need isn't to construct a perfect gender theory or completely rewrite biology with culture, but to understand the ongoing dialogue between genes, hormones, the brain, and culture. Lean in and truly listen to each child's life-shaped experiences and expressions, regardless of their chromosomes. This way, we can break free from labels and avoid more David-style judgments.